you're good to go. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you all tonight on a subject I'm very passionate about, which is, um, hang on, point is not working, Richard. Ah, low carbohydrate eating. Um, as you can see from my title, Eat Yourself Healthy. I hope that over the next 20 to 30 minutes, you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about and how you might actually be able to do that. Before I start, I'd please ask you all to keep an open mind about what I'm going to talk about. Um, based on this on my own experience, experience I've had with patients and what I've studied and learned about. And just to reiterate the fact that there's no single way of eating for all people. This is just my experience of what I'm trying to um, impart to others. And um, not one, there's not one way of eating that fits all. So um, over the last few years especially, I've started to really appreciate the importance of nutrition to human health, not having really taken much notice of it in the first 20 to five, 25 years of my practice. Um, and I've started to realise just how important it is in terms of wellness, in terms of morbidity and mortality. And I've also become fascinated by the nutritional advice that we've received over the last 50 years and its impact on healthcare, especially in the Western world. When I left medical school, I had no tools for giving dietary advice. Basically, I had to make it up as I went. I'd write things down, give it to patients on a piece of paper, download stuff off the internet, or if I was lucky enough, I could refer to a dietitian. So I'd actually say this is a huge fail uh, in medical education. And I just wonder if this still goes on to some degree these days. So my talk is partly about this. This is the healthy food pyramid, which you all will be familiar with. So at the bottom, we're supposed to eat most of fruits, vegetables, cereals and breads. As we ascend, lesser amounts of lean meat, fish, poultry, nuts, eggs and dairy products. And at the top, least of all fats and oils, salt, sugar and alas, alcohol. But my talk is also about this. This is the fattening of New Zealand between 1977 and 2012. This is from the Ministry of Health. You can see in 1977, approximately 10% of the population were obese. 2012, it's approaching 30%, and now it's over 30%. We're the third fattest country in the OECD. And I regard low-fat diet as being responsible for that. So um, my talk is about reduced carbohydrate intake leading to better health. Otherwise termed more whole food <coughs> reduced total glycemic load. Also can be called low carbohydrate eating, or it's more uh, stricter form, ketogenic eating. And I would maintain that with low carb, you can help the patients. You can improve and or reverse some medical conditions. You can reduce medication use. You will see results and you'll improve job satisfaction, which I think is something that we all want to be able to do. And I think you can see what your patients eat themselves healthy, improve quality of life and maybe even live longer. So an overview of my presentation tonight, I'm going to start with the evolution of the low-fat diet and the diet heart hypothesis. And I'm going to focus quite a bit of time on the, on the question of, is saturated fat necessarily the enemy? Because if with this way of eating, we're actually allocating more, more fat, more animal fat, therefore saturated fat. And we want to make sure that we're not doing people harm or ourselves harm. I'm going to ask the question, were the low-fat dietary guidelines actually valid? and a consequence of the low-fat diet is another topic. I'll follow this with about low-carb eating, how to eat low-carb, some of my patients' results, and results from some low-carb studies. So in my opinion, it all starts here with this man called Ansel Keys in the 1940s. He actually determined that men, middle-aged men who had raised cholesterol would actually die early from heart disease. And so he researched this in 1952, presented the six countries study at the Mount Sinai conference. And in this graph, you've got two, two curves, men aged 55 to 59 and 45 to 49, in six countries. And he's plotting deaths versus fat in the diet. And this is a really impressive graph. You can see that as more fat increases in the diet, more people die, more men die. But this wasn't the whole story. At that time, there were 16 more countries on which data was available, but he left them out. And so when you put those 16, but we'll put all 22 countries into the graph, you can actually see a scatter diagram. In other words, there's no sign of any correlation. In actual fact, you can correlate high fat intake with longevity. So in 1955, the WHO actually disregarded the six country study and saying there was no body of evidence to back up the correlation. 
Undeterred though, Ansel Keys went on to promote his diet heart hypothesis, which says that increased saturated fat in the diet elevates cholesterol and that leads to heart disease. So in 1956, he initiated the Seven Countries Study, which was published in 1978. This is a large multinational study of over 12,500 middle-aged men living in rural communities in Italy, Greece, Yugoslavia, Finland, Japan, Netherlands, and the United States. And it suggested there was an association between cholesterol and chronic heart disease. But when you actually look at the study design and how it was undertaken, there's some huge flaws there and cause into question the validity of, of the data and the conclusions. And this was an epidemiological study, so this was never ever going to prove anything. It was just going to form an association between saturated fat or cholesterol and heart disease. And again, like before, you cherry pick some countries. For example, in Finland, a lot of young men died or got early heart disease and they had lots of saturated fat. Anyway, the study was still regarded as a, as, a, as a landmark study, so much so that in 1961, the American Heart Association produced a report stating that the best scientific evidence of the time strongly suggests Americans reduce their risk of heart disease by reducing saturated fat. This statement was principally down to personalities and connections such as Ansel Keys, who was very forceful, would argue things to the point of death. He was a bully and he knew people in the science community as well as politics and was able to forward his, his thinking. Now, in 1977, under John McGovern, the United States Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs produced its dietary goals for the American people. And at the time, they concluded that the current diet was excessively rich in meat and other sources of saturated fat and cholesterol, and that this was linked to heart disease, some cancers, diabetes, and obesity. So they recommended reducing total fat, saturated fat and cholesterol, sugar and salt, increasing carbohydrates to up to 60% of daily energy. And in 1984, Lipid Research Clinic's primary prevention trial, this lowered cholesterol by using diet plus a drug. And they were able to suggest that this would therefore lower the risk of heart disease. And this was actually a drug trial, so perhaps it wasn't quite representative of what they were trying to do. But so much so, the National Institutes of Health then proclaimed, there is no doubt that the low-fat diet will afford significant protection against chronic heart disease to every American over the age of two. Now, that strikes me as a bit pretentious, that statement. But anyway, that was taken as such. And in 1992, the US Department of Agriculture produced its food pyramid, and that spread across continents and was adopted by many authorities. So if you remove fat from the diet, food tastes awful. So you've got to replace it with something. What can you replace it with? Carbohydrates. Of course, this was unleashing a whole industry of carbohydrate uh, substitution for fat, and that had consequences, has consequences. I would ask the question, why did they not look at the issue a different way? We know that's what Keyes initially thought cholesterol was the problem. He then changed his mind when he found that if he gave people cholesterol, the cholesterol did not go up. And so he then focused on saturated fat, which can raise cholesterol. Not always. And I would have thought it would have been better to study populations with a high percentage of fat in their diet, especially saturated fat, as well as populations in general. And if saturated fats are the principal cause of chronic heart disease, then what happens when they are re reduced or replaced? Now, more modern studies tend to try and reverse prove the diet heart hypothesis, that's known as the cholesterol hypothesis. In other words, they reduce cholesterol, uh, total cholesterol and LDL through diet or statins, or they replace them with polyunsaturated fats. <clears throat> so in terms of population, saturated fat and chronic heart disease, when you look at populations who eat traditionally a lot of, lot of fat, especially animal fat, such as the Maasai in Africa, the Inuit in northern Canada, or Navajo Indians, etc., it's never been shown that that diet, that saturated, high saturated fat diet, is associated with heart disease. And then in 1958, a Western Electric study was an observational study of 1900 middle aged men looked at in terms of cholesterol. And at four years into the study, there was no association between saturated fat and heart disease. And at 23 years, there were actually more coronary events in the low fat group. So they concluded the amount of saturated fats was not significantly associated with the risk of chronic heart disease death. In 2006, there was a Women's Health Initiative, a massive study. And in the observational arm of the study, there were over 93,000 women who were, who were observed. And low-fat diet did not reduce the risk of heart disease or stroke in that group. Germany, Switzerland and France, three countries who had traditionally high levels of saturated fat in their diet and low incidence of heart disease. That's a paradox <clears throat> because we're told high fat equals heart disease. So I suggest that saturated fat might not be as bad as we think. 
What about saturated fat reduction and replacement in heart disease? Last year, Robert Dubroff from Albuquerque published this study. He identified 17 meta-analyses that looked at the relationship of dietary fat, cardiovascular disease, and mortality. And just to remind you, a meta-analysis is pooling of many studies, or one or, one or several or many studies, and analyzing the data in a certain way to give you perhaps the most accurate reflection of what is trying to be shown. So meta-analyses are the, the pinnacle of analysis, essentially. And they identified 11 studies with mortality outcomes and reduced saturated fat intake. But of these, only two of the 11 reported mortality benefit, therefore nine did not. We found 14 studies that had event outcomes, heart attack, etc., stroke, angina, um, and reduced saturated fat intake. And of these, only six reported a benefit, therefore eight did not. Eight studies looked at replacing saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats. None of these reported a mortality benefit, and only two reported a reduction in cardiac events, therefore six did not. One secondary prevention study replaced saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats, failed to show a reduction in mortality or events. So they concluded most meta-analyses do not support the theory that saturated fat reduction or substitution reduces coronary heart disease. Okay, so the other question is, were the dietary saturated fat guidelines actually valid when they came out? Now Zoe Harkham did a PhD in this subject and in 2014 she's a UK researcher, did a systematic review and a meta-analysis of randomised controlled trials before 1983. The guidelines came out in 1977 in the US and 1983 in the UK, so any studies prior to that were fair game for analysis. So she looked at them in terms of dietary fat, cholesterol, and development of chronic heart disease. There were five secondary prevention studies and one primary prevention study. Cholesterol reductions were higher in the intervention groups, but there were no differences in coronary heart disease or all-cause mortality. So the evidence was not there. Dietary saturated fat recommendations were made in the absence of randomized controlled trial evidence. She then looked at the evidence available in 2016 another systematic review and meta-analysis of RCTs. <clears throat> Looked at dietary fat, cholesterol and coronary heart disease again. Over 62,000 individuals in 10 trials, of which seven were secondary prevention, one was primary and two were combined. And again, cholesterol was re reduced to the greatest degree in the intervention groups, but there was no difference in coronary heart disease or all-cause mortality. So what that tells us is that in 2016, there was no randomized controlled trial evidence to support the dietary saturated fat guidelines. That's a bit worrying, isn't it? Got these guidelines, but no, no, no proof. And the other point to note is that 12 of these 16 trials or studies were in secondary prevention. In other words, these people really had heart disease, and so they were doing analysis on people with diseased arteries. Does that relate to us, who probably don't have heart disease, and we're actually concerned with primary prevention? It just raises some, some questions. So a consequence of the low-fat diet or unrestricted carbs is this graph I've already shown you, obesity which leads to metabolic syndrome, which leads to pre-diabetes, diabetes and its complications, and more. Some people would even regard dementia as type 3 diabetes. What are the effects of carbs or glucose on the body? We know that carbs are starch are broken down to glucose, and we know that some glucose is used for energy, most is stored as glycogen, and the main dough, when the glycogen stores are full, is converted to fat via insulin, and insulin is the fat storage hormone. The raised glucose is a toxin, we see that in pre-diabetes, we'll start to see it then. We definitely see it in diabetes with kidney failure, heart, fail or heart attacks, strokes, peripheral neuropathy, blindness and limbs. So I would regard carbs as being bad energy. Now how does low carb work? It's on the premise that exogenous sugar, starch, carbs, glucose, whatever you want to call it, are not required. We actually make our own or make most of what we need. So we either break down glycogen to glucose or we make glucose to gluconeogenesis. Therefore, there's no reliance on exogenous glucose for energy. Reduced carbs, therefore, we tend, means that we use fat for energy, either fat that is eaten or fat that is stored around our middles, typically. And there are degrees of carb restriction depending on the, the desired results, if it's weight loss, universal diabetes, etc. Ketosis is a state where you break down fat into ketones and use those ketones for energy. It's different from ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis is only present in diabetes, type 1 diabetes, when they have no insulin, get very sick and die, or get very sick. There's no way you can go from ketosis to ketoacidosis 
unless you have type 1 diabetes and no insulin. So there's no risk of that happening. So you, as I said, you're using energy from ketones to fuel the brain and fuel the muscles. And you're eating to stay full for longer. Now, how do I start low carb? I do this on a one-to-one -one basis. It's a little time consuming, but very rewarding. I identify people who I think might benefit from this, and I ask them, you know, are they interested in improving their health via dietary change? We talk about the philosophy of low carb, that might apply to them, and we come up with some shared objectives. I also refer them to dietdoctor.com, an invaluable resource with lots of free information. It basically is funded by a minimal subscription, no third party advertising. It's got videos, meal plans, recipes, presentations. It's always updating and it's, I think it's fabulous. And then I give them a list of things to eat and what not to eat to talk this through with them. I'm just very quickly going to rush through the things to eat and not to eat. All right? So starting with foods that I would recommend eating with low carb. Um, you're looking at meat in all its natural forms. You're looking at seafood, especially oily fish for your <laughs> omega-3s. You're looking at eggs any number, any way you like. Dairy, full cream, Greek yogurt, fatty cheese, butter, full cream milk. Vegetables, essentially anything that grows above the ground that doesn't store starch in its roots like potatoes and kumara. Um, fruit would really be limited to berries most of the time. Fats and oils, olive oil, mayonnaise, lard, butter, ghee, coconut oil. And then nuts and seeds except peanuts and cashews. And down the bottom a few drinks there. Next page, there we go. So um, foods to avoid with low carb eating might be fairly obvious. Pasta, rice, potatoes, bread, porridge, chocolate. Fruit, as I said, should really be a treat, not a staple in my opinion. Dry fruit even more so. And then fats and oils. Now you've got margarine, you've got sunflower oil, you've got canola oil. All these oils are cold pressed and then altered in a factory. Now why the hell would you eat something like that or use something like that? That's only done so they last longer on the shelf so you can heat them to a higher heat. But I'd rather go because I'm natural personally. Then drinks vary in the amount of carb content. Dairy, again, anything that's concentrated or low fat <coughs> has more carbs in it, powdered, included. Then meat and fish, you're looking at battered, sugar-coated meat pies, highly processed foods. And then fast foods would be fairly obvious. And then sauces that we cook with and can buy often have quite a lot of carbs in them. And down the bottom, some other things to, to avoid. So a little bit more about low carb eating. Um, tend to avoid the big five, pasta, potatoes, rice, fruit and starchy vegetables. Bread, I missed out, sorry. Um, just to note, this is not a religion, right? You can actually have, have a bit of a life still. It's not about not ever having these things, you know? Life is to be lived as well. So you can have a pie, you can have a takeaway. It's not about that. It's about what you do on top of everything else that you normally eat. It's perhaps more important. You're eating more animal fat, more meat, and more, more fat relative to meat. And you adapt. People often ask me, you know, what about my sweet tooth? And what about bread and potatoes? I love them. Well, you don't tend to miss them if you're not hungry. If you're sated, you don't think about it as often. And I can't think of the last time I had bread or potatoes. A long time. And I love them, but just don't miss them. And then there are degrees of carb reduction. You've got approximately 50 to 100 grams being the low carb range, less than 20 grams leaving the keto range. Monitoring, I usually recommend an app such as my fitness pal for the first one to two weeks, just so people get a handle on, on carb intake and fat and protein as well. I encourage people to read labels so they get an idea of what they're actually buying. Now, who should, do not, who should not do a strict low carb diet without experienced medical input? Diabetes, renal impairment, pregnancy and breastfeeding, I would say. So initial measurements and monitoring, I usually start with height, weight and blood pressure and bloods including thyroid function, liver function, HbA1c creatinine and fasting lipids. And then monitoring initially on a, maybe a monthly basis, we get further measurements and gauge how much carbohydrate people are eating. It's quite interesting. If you ask people what their last three meals were, it's very difficult for them to remember. Um, but it gives you an indication of what they're actually eating. And you can look at their apps as well. And then bloods is required. And then ongoing advice and support. Check the variety, that they're not getting bored, not too many eggs, or not, not getting fed up with eggs or bacon, you know, just so there's variety there. So there's a balanced diet. And then do you need to increase their carb restriction or do you need to consider fasting? Some of the side effects of very low carb eating include headache, constipation, keto breath, and leg cramps. And these usually only last a few days as they're adapting to burning ketones. 
They can be overcome with Panadol, laxative, pet mints, and a little bit of extra salt. Some of the rarer side effects include keto flu, rash, palpitations, and hair loss. Palpitations usually take the form of intraflect topics and tend to last a few days and disappear. So, note about the low carb lipid profile. This is quite interesting. Fasting triglycerides will often normalize, which is a good thing. HDL will often increase, which is a good thing. And LDL may decrease or increase. I just make a note about LDL because the LDL actually has two, at least two components to it. You have the large fluffy component, which is increased by saturated fats. You have the small dense LDL, which is unchanged by saturated fats, but is increased by low fat diets. And it's the small dense LDL, which is associated with chronic heart disease and stroke. And when you get that LDL increase, it's not harmful. It's actually the harmless LDL that increases the number, not the bad LDL. But we can't measure these in New Zealand yet. We can measure them by sending specimens to Australia, but not many people do that. So I'd just like to present six patients of mine. I had some pretty good results and fairly pleased. So there's a lot more patients than this. So it's just a, just a flavor of what's, what's happened. So this is a 31-year-old male who was known to have pre-diabetes. He was a normal BMI. And you can see his HbA1c started at 112, but within six months, he got that down to 41. And maintained the pre-diabetic range for the next 14 months, just by changing what he eats. Next one is another 31-year-old male who was overweight but no pre-diabetes. Started with an HbA1c of 93. That came right down to 49, a bit of a bumpy ride, and he got the message, and now his latest HbA1c is 36 on no medication. That's at 17 months. This is a 61-year-old um, male who was overweight, and he's reversed his type 2 diabetes. He was diet controlled. His HbA1c started at 61, got down to 44, to maintain the pre-diabetic range for the, last, for the last 17 months. It took him four months to get into that pre-diabetic range. This one I'm particularly proud of. This is a 70-year-old female who was overweight and at the time was intolerant of oral, oral medications that were available at the time. On the top, you can see her weight as it comes down. On the bottom, you can see her HbA1c. Now, she was able to take her HbA1c from 101 down to 43 within seven months and maintain a pre-diabetic range for the next 10 months, getting down to 41 at the end. She lost 65, 32 kilos in weight. She was on Lantus, 65 units, and has stopped it totally from no oral medication. And she has saved nearly four and a half thousand dollars in terms of cost of just on the Lantus alone. This is, can you move that? Uh, okay. Yeah. Hi, Joanne. And this is the reverse of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is a 55-year-old male who within 10 months lost 25 kilos. On the left here, looking from right to left, you can see his liver function just normalizing. On the right-hand side, again from right to left, you can see his lipid profile. His triglycerides have plummeted. His HDL has risen. His LDL is now measurable, and his cholesterol ratio is, is improved. Weight loss and blood pressure improvement, a 70-year-old female, lost 10 kilos over five months and maintained that weight loss for 20 months. More importantly, she was on Slazapil, top dose, five milligrams a day. Then have to stop that as a result of just changing what she eats and losing that weight. She's still overweight, but it's, it's not just about the weight, it's also about the drive from insulin with carb exposure. And finally, this is a 48-year-old male who's pretty hefty and over 13 months lost 41 kilos He's a work in progress, he's very happy. And at the start of this, he put money aside for bariatric surgery. He's now spent that money on a Ford Mustang, so he's got to carry on. <laughs> but he's actually very happy with what he's done, you know, and he can now fit in the driver's seat, which is even better. <laughs> so just a little bit about some of the research. This is the Verta Health Study. It's an American group who looked at patients with type 2 diabetes for a year. And they had a 262 study subjects and 87 controls in the study group known as continuous care inter intervention. They had remote monitoring and advice and they were following a low carb or ketogenic way of eating versus usual care, which was in the clinic or general practice. Now in the intervention group, their average HbA1c dropped from 60 to 45. Average weight loss was 12% of body weight. 94% of those on insulin either reduced or stopped it. 100% stopped sulfonylureas. Markers of inflammation and abnormal liver function tests improved. And this is over and above all the safe thing to do. There were no issues there. Versus usual care, where there was no change in HbA1c, no change in weight, no change in medication, probably escalation in fact. 
So in over 53% of patients, they were able to reverse their diabetes. That is an HbA1c of less than 48 without any medication other than perhaps metformin. They then went on to study some of these patients, another 100, 143 of these patients as far as three and a half years. And in this group, there were statistically significant improvements in HbA1c, weight, triglycerides, and HDL. Total cholesterol and LDL were unchanged. Over 45% went into the were, were attained to the pre-diabetes pre-diabetes range. 52% on no medication and remained just on metformin. And they remitted diabetes in 22%. That's over a fifth obtained an HbA1c of less than 39 without medication, that is at three and a half years. Now, Dr. David Unwin just published this month. He's a GP in the UK and the father of low carb eating in primary care. He'd been watching his patients for the last six years or so, gathering data, and he reported on 199 of them. Average duration of low carb diet, 23 months. These were people with either type two diabetes or pre-diabetes. He was able to achieve drug-free remission of 40% of 6% of people with diabetes. 93% of people with pre-diabetes achieved remission. And there were significant improvements in weight, blood pressure, and lipid profiles. Older patients did as well as younger patients. And I found that to be true as well. And he saved over 50,000 pounds on the annual drug budget for diabetes alone within his own just single practice. Imagine what that extends to through the whole country if you were able to do that. Now, some of the benefits from metabolic effects of low-carb eating. This is a graph, a table graph, showing in the dark grey, the low-carb way of eating versus the light grey, which is the low-fat way of eating. And you can see that low-carb wins across the board. If it's body mass, abdominal fat, triglycerides, HDL, small LDL, everything improves with low-carb more than it does with low-fat. So I'm nearly finished. <laughs> um, newsflash, Diabetes UK and Diabetes Australia now accept a role for the low-carb diet and diabetes management. Another newsflash, the US, US authorities now have no upper limit to the daily recommended intake of cholesterol. Something is changing, I think. There may be progress on the way. I'd like to think so. I don't recommend, please don't be afraid to do this, you know. Ask, learn and have a go, because there's a lot to be gained, not just for your patients, but for yourselves as well. So remember the benefits of low-carb eating. Diabetes improvement, diabetes reversal, weight loss, and reversal of fatty liver. Improved blood pressure control, IBS scored, improved migraine, PCOS, and chronic fatigue. That's pretty impressive just by changing your diet. The take-home messages are these. We do not need dietary carbohydrates to function normally. The low-fat diet has made us fat and made us sick. I can attest to that. Um, fat can't make you fat, carbohydrates make you fat. Low carb eating is easy to understand and gets results. And it is, it is sustainable. All macro and micronutrients are included, and that's important to note. These are free tools, free to use forever, and there's no membership fee. Low fat, fat free is carbohydrates. And there's no benefit from low saturated fat intake or substituting saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats. <clears throat> I can think of only four groups that benefit from reduced fat or increased carbohydrates in the diet. And it's a grain industry cooking oil industry, the diet industry, and big pharma. So reversing obesity and its related disorders one patient at a time, I think your country needs you. So find, where to find out more? People, I'm always happy to talk about this. Websites, dietdoctor.com. Professional training, nutrition network, do courses online, and you can get credit for, for this, this whole process. Documentaries, Magic Pill, Fats Documentary, and Fed Up, downloadable, available online, incredibly useful and informative about what I've been talking about. Books, Big Fat Surprise, Good Calories, Bad Calories, written by two exceptional investigative journalists. And from New Zealand, What the Fat, written by Grant Schofield, Karen Zinn, and Craig Roger from AUT. Talks about the science, talks about the method, and talks about some recipes. And there's some Facebook groups out there, such as Low Carb Doctor in New Zealand, which some people may have heard of. Um, please don't just believe me. Question what you've been taught. Do your own research, because I did, and I was shocked. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening. <laughs>
couple of minutes of discussion or burning questions before yeah, yeah. we move on. Yeah. Uh, quick question, uh, Marcus. Thank you very much. Is um, uh, and those studies, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're powerful, quite compelling, really. Um, just in the background of those studies, was the um, did they ever look at the physical activity component? Did they look at these people in terms of sedentary lifestyle versus their physical activity in respect to the people that they sampled? I'm just wondering, curious to know in respect to HDL and, mm. and the benefits of increasing HDL with physical activity, whether these people's activity, both inactivity or um, or activity, was measured at any point, or was it not? I don't think it was in at all. Whether they were marathon athletes or whether they were. Uh, sitting at a desk all day. Um, I just wondered whether that had been a factor that they considered in the research. In, in my reading, I've not come across any sort of uh, activity level yeah. indicator or, or measure to determine no, whether there was another factor at play. No. Yeah. Okay. I think the variety of patients in terms of body size and activity is probably fairly broad spread and yeah. evens out in the end. Yeah. I don't yeah. know specifically. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I've never heard about the LDL, the, the large, fluffy, and the small kinds. Um, is that something that's kind of commonly known? Sorry, I'm a nurse prescriber. Um, is that something that's kind of commonly known, or uh, like if I look that up, will I be able to find information about that? If you Google it, you'll find it. Well, I can point in the direction of that. It's something that I never knew about before I went on this whole process of learning about low carb eating. Um, it's not taught, but you, when you look at the, the makeup of LDL, yes, you can, you can fractionate it or electrophorese it, and it breaks down to subcomponents. Um, but I wouldn't say it's widely known. I don't know if other people know about it, but um, I hadn't heard about it, you know, uh, two or three years ago. And the other thing is, um, what about skinny people with high cholesterol? Because it's, it is interesting, like um, the Heart Foundation was very, very slow to change their heart pyramid. And it's, finally changing it's been very frustrating but yeah what about the skinny people with high cholesterol we might get skinnier on a low carb diet but maybe not necessarily i don't know no you can be skinny on the on the on the, on the diet I, I think cholesterol in itself is not something that one focuses on in isolation mm. you factor in what's happening in terms of the hdl in terms of smoking general uh, you know, family history and all those other factors that come to form the, the risk analysis so I wouldn't focus just on the cholesterol itself. I think cholesterol above 10 is probably a concern because it suggests a genetic issue. But below that, and as long as the ratio is favourable, I mean, I saw a lady today, she had a cholesterol of 9.2. 9 Her HDL was good enough, so her five-year risk was something like 1%. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we've got a huge database yes, we're we're drawing on. Yeah, so no, don't just look at the cholesterol in isolation. We're taught to look at mm -hmm. cholesterol in isolation. And years ago, we prescribed statins to people with a cholesterol above five. But that now is not... Why we should be looking at things. Yeah. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions, yeah. Marcus. Um, is high fat diet suitable for patients with um, fat and low fat? Absolutely. Because you can't get fat from getting fat. What you're doing, fatty liver is driven by glucose, by sugar, and insulin. All right. So if you take sugar, the insulin then comes along and puts it into cells, puts it into liver cells and other cells, fat cells. So the fatty liver is driven by insulin. That's why that case I showed. He, he followed the diet and his liver function normalised. We haven't got a scan, but you can see his numbers are normal. So it's because you're taking with the insulin drive, you're therefore using fat. If you, if you don't have insulin in the system to any significant degree, then you can't make fat. What you do is you use fat that's in you for energy. And if the carbs, obviously, that triggers the insulin. Absolutely. Right? So we need Absolutely. to have high fats and then low carbs. Yeah, well, yes, correct. Because, yeah. I mean, what happens is we're, we're you know, a lot of our generation are, are suffering from insulin resistance and therefore metabolic syndrome. And that's the biggest driver probably to lots of things like hypertension as well as obesity and everything else. So, yeah. And for people who are getting success from the low carbs and high fat diet, um, how long do you suggest someone to stay on that diet or would you, would you have a timeline when you say, okay, I'm yeah, going to start? Until they die. Okay. Yeah, because I believe it's, I mean, there are various degrees. As I say, it depends what you want to achieve. If you want to reverse diabetes, you try and get someone to go keto. If you want someone just to live a healthy life, they might do Mediterranean, which is almost a form of a, a low-carb-ish, um, maybe a little bit more carbs than at most low-carb. But, you know, you, you're looking to maintain a healthy lifestyle, and what you don't want is exposure to carbs, because that's constant driving insulin. I've got skinny people, as you saw in the first case, who's got diabetes. And why is that? You know, 
There may be genetic components, sure, but you know, some of it's driven by cars, so you can reverse it by taking away the cars. You can't cure it, they can stop it continuing, which is the key. And actually, if you eat low carb, you actually feel better. Overall, you've got more energy, you get up and go in the mornings, and the, and the afternoons after lunch as well. You mentioned quickly in there about fasting. Yeah. When would you introduce that? Uh, fasting is really, you typically using that to, to help people lose weight. And you would only really do that, in my experience, once someone's actually been on, on in the ketogenic range. There's probably no point fasting if you're not keto, because what you're doing is trying to fast and eating carbs. And that's just, that's just an oxymoron, really. So basically, you get into the ketogenic range by eating practically no carbs. And if the weight's not coming off, then you would look at fasting. And there's various regimes you can use, 16, 8, 1, 2, 3 days. I recently did a four-day fast just for the hell of it. It was interesting, no, because I'm keto adapted. It wasn't really a big thing. You had a few hunger pangs on day one, and then that was overcome. Just drink plenty of fluids, and it goes. And it's quite interesting to, to get to that last last day. And it works. But then I had to Kevin, what, 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 what would Kevin say? Hey? What would Kevin say? She said, I lost some weight, so I should probably drink less red wine. <laughs> <laughs> Why, why peanut is not... Uh, it's high carb. Uh, yeah, or a significant, significant carb in peanuts, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> right, sit down.